I, I was really going on the warning quite quite a lot. I was warning everyone I could. I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. Um, if I were to guess, I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. You ever met with Obama, and just for one reason, look, just to watch talk out. about AI. Yes. And what did he say? We're still a reasonably long way away from uh, that kind of generalized AI. Uh, generally speaking, that's probably not the thing that we need to worry about the most right now. I met with Congress. I, I was at a meeting of all 50 governors. AI is a rare case where I think we need to be proactive in regulation instead of reactive. Um, because I think by the time we are reactive in AI regulation, it's too late. And I talked to everyone I could. No one seemed to realize where this was going. We are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens. Within a century or two, Earth will be dominated by entities that are more different from us than we are different from Neanderthals or from chimpanzees. Because in the coming generations, we will learn how to engineer bodies and brains and minds. These will be the main products of the economy, of the 21st century economy. Not textiles and vehicles and weapons, but bodies and brains and minds. For the first time in history, we are approaching a point when an external system can understand me better than I understand myself. And, and this, is the, this is the crisis, I feel, the big crisis, I think, of, of, of humanism. And we are going to see more and more the authority to make decisions in the world shifting from voters and customers and individuals shifting to algorithms that understand people better than the people understand themselves. If you, if you can't beat it, join it. From a long-term existential standpoint, that's like the purpose of Neuralink, is to create a high bandwidth interface to the brain such that we can be symbiotic with AI. Because we have a bandwidth problem. You just can't communicate through your fingers, it's too slow. What's what's the idea behind it? Like, what are you trying to accomplish with it? Like, what would you like? Best case scenario. I think best case scenario we effectively merge with AI, uh, where we AI serves as a tertiary cognition layer. So you're you're currently in a symbiotic relationship. Your your cortex and limbic system are in a symbiotic relationship. Now, if, if we do have a third layer which is the AI extension of yourself that is also symbiotic, then that could be a good outcome. That could be quite a positive outcome for the future. It will, it will enable anyone who wants to have superhuman cognition. And where's Neuralink at right now? Hello, everybody. So the, the, the why of Neuralink, the, in fact, the, the main reason for doing this presentation is recruiting. Um, and this will be a slow process where we will gradually increase 
the um, issues that we solve. Ultimately, we can do a full uh, brain-machine interface. Yeah, this is going to sound pretty weird, but um, achieve a sort of symbiosis with artificial intelligence. But I think with um, a high bandwidth brain machine interface, I think we can actually go along for the ride. Um, and we can effectively have the option of merging with AI. So just to give you a sense of scale, this is how tiny the threads are. Um, and there's a thousand of them. And you really can't manipulate these with your hand. That, that part at the top is uh, just a backing material that's surgical packaging. They're, they're peeled off. Uh, the threads are peeled off that one at a time by the robot to place into the brain. And this is what, what the robot looks like. Qu quite, quite a complex device, but it, uh, it, it all comes down to a very tiny, tiny point. What looks like the needles for insertion next to a penny, but in fact the, the, the actual needle that gets inserted is way, way tinier. It's that little tiny thing at the, the, where the arrow is pointing. That's actually the size of the, the needle. It's about 24 microns in diameter. Uh, we developed this robot that can rapidly and precisely insert hundreds of individual threads representing thousands of distinct electrodes into the cortex in less than an hour. This tool allows a surgeon to aim between the blood vessels that cover the surface of the brain with micron scale precision. The region of the brain shown in this video uh, represents uh, only a few millimeters of surface of the brain. As you can see, the brain's surface moves with the heartbeat and breathing. The robot tracks and adjusts for this movement. Using this tool, we can greatly reduce the risk of harming cortical vessels and causing bleeding. And so the N1 implant, um, we can place, as Elon mentioned, many of these, possibly up to 10. In one hemisphere, for our first patients, we're looking at four, four sensors, three in motor areas and one in a somatosensory area. And that connects wirelessly through the skin to a wearable device that we call the Link, which contains a Bluetooth radio and a battery. With that, we think that people will be able to get naturalistic control over their computers, not just a mouse, but also a keyboard, game controllers, and potentially other devices. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, so potentially with a device like this, you could restore speech to a paralyzed person who's no longer able to talk. But there's no reason in principle that we can't reach all of motor cortex. And that would give us access to any movement that a person thinks about, any movement at all. A person could imagine running or dancing or even kung fu, and we would be able to decode that signal. What Neuralink wants to do is to give people the ability to tap into those representations, to get ac better access to that information, both to repair broken brain circuits and also to ultimately give us better access to better connections to the world, to each other, and to ourselves. Dangers we've seen in futurist AI dystopian movies, where it's the AI versus a brave band of humans for control of humanity is not realistic. The idea that we're merging with AI is not some uh, concept in the future, it's happening now. We're going to increasingly merge with these technologies. Uh, we'll have direct connection, and not just to do things like search and translate, but to actually extend the power of our thinking and uh, give us more neocortical modules and more hierarchy to our neocortex, which will make us smarter. We, we got more neocortex two million years ago when we got these big foreheads. But that was enough to enable us to create language and art and music. Every human culture we've ever discovered has music. No other primate has music because they don't have the, this additional neocortex we got two million years ago. We're going to do it again by connecting our neocortex to the cloud, to synthetic neocortex in the cloud, and 
basically get again more neocortex and that will be an enabling factor to create more profound music, to be funnier, to be more artistic, uh, to basically enhance the qualities of humanity that we uh, value. Do you think we will ever create an AI system that we can love and loves us back in a deep, meaningful way like in the movie Her? Hello, I'm here. Oh. Hi. I think AI will be capable of convincing you to fall in love with it very well. And that's different than us humans. You know, we start getting into a metaphysical question of like, do emotions and thoughts exist in a different realm than the physical? But, but from a physics standpoint, I tend to think, I tend to think of things, essentially, if, if it loves you in a way that, is, that you can't tell whether it's real or not, it is real. That's a physics view of love. Yeah. <laughs> if there's no, if you, if, the, if you cannot just, if you cannot prove that it does not, if there's no test that you can apply that would make it Make, allow you to tell the difference, then there is no difference. Right. And it's similar to uh, seeing our world as simulation. There may not be a test to tell the difference between what the real world and yes. the simulation, and therefore, from a physics perspective, it might as well be the same thing. Yes. It, and there may be ways to test whether it's a simulation. There might be. I'm not saying there aren't. But you could certainly imagine that a simulation could, could correct that once an entity in the simulation found a way to detect the simulation, it could either restart, the, you know, pause the simulation, start a new simulation, or do one of many other things that then corrects for that error. So when maybe you or somebody else creates an AGI system and you get to ask her one question, what would that question be? What's outside the simulation? <laughs> <laughs>